The Nose by Nikolai Gogol, narrated by Paul Skinner. 1. On the 25th of March, a very strange occurrence took place in St. Petersburg. On the Ascension Avenue, there lived a barber of the name of Ivan Yakovlevich. He had his family name, and on his signboard, on which was depicted the head of a gentleman with one cheek soaked, the only inscription to be read was, Blood letting done here. On this particular morning, he awoke pretty early. Becoming aware of the smell of fresh-baked bread, he sat up a little in bed and saw his wife, who had a special partiality for coffee, in the act of taking some fresh-baked bread out of the oven. "'Today, Praskovnia Osipovna,' he said, "'I do not want any coffee. I should like a fresh loaf with onions. "'The blockhead may eat bread only as far as I am concerned,' said his wife to herself. "'Then I shall have a chance of getting some coffee.' "'And she threw a loaf on the table. "'For the sake of propriety, Ivan Yakovlevich drew a coat over his shirt, "'sat down at the table, shook out some salt for himself, "'prepared two onions, assumed a serious expression, "'and began to cut the bread. "'After he had cut the loaf in two halves, he looked, "'and, to his great astonishment, saw something whitish sticking in it. He carefully poked around it with his knife, and felt it with his finger. Quite firmly fixed, he murmured in his beard. What can it be? He put in his finger and drew out a nose. Ivan Yakovlevich at first let his hands fall from sheer astonishment. Then he rubbed his eyes and began to feel it. A nose, an actual nose. And moreover, it seemed to be the nose of an acquaintance. Alarm and terror were depicted in Ivan's face. But these feelings were slight in comparison to the disgust which took possession of his wife. Whose nose have you cut off, you monster? she screamed, her face red with anger. You scoundrel, you tippler, I myself will report you to the police. Such a rascal! Many customers have told me that while you were shaving them, you held them so tight by the nose that they could hardly sit still. But Ivan Yakovlevich was more dead than alive. He saw at once that this nose could belong to no other than Kovalov, a member of the municipal committee, whom he shaved every Sunday and Wednesday. Stop, Praskovny Osipovna. I will wrap it in a piece of cloth and place it in the corner. There it may remain for the present. Later I will take it away. No, not there shall I endure an amputated nose in my room. You understand nothing except how to strop a razor. You know nothing of the duties and obligations of a respectable man, you vagabond. You good for nothing. Am I to undertake all responsibility for you at the police office? You soap smearer, you blockhead, take it away where you like and don't let it stay under my eyes. Ivan Yakovlevich stood there flabbergasted. He thought and thought and knew not what he thought. The devil knows how it happened, he said at last, scratching his head behind the ear. Whether I came home drunk last night or not, I really don't know, but in all probability this is a quite extraordinary occurrence, for a loaf is something that is baked, and a nose is something different. I don't understand the matter at all. And Ivan Yakovlevich was silent. The thought that the police might find him in unlawful possession of a nose and arrest him robbed him of all presence of mind. Already he began to have visions of a red collar with a silver braid and of a sword, and he trembled all over. At last he finished dressing himself, and to the accompaniment of the emphatic exultations of his spouse, he wrapped up the nose in a cloth and issued into the street. He intended to lose it somewhere, either at somebody's door, or in a public square, or in a narrow alley. But just then, in order to complete his bad luck, he was met by an acquaintance who showered inquiries upon him. Hello, Ivan Yakovlevich, where are you going to shave so early in the morning? etc. So that he could find no suitable opportunity to do what he wanted. 
Later on, he did let the nose drop, but a sentry bore down upon him with his halberd and said, Look out, you have let something drop. And Ivan Yakovovich was obliged to pick it up and put it in his pocket. A feeling of despair began to take possession of him, all the more as the streets became more thronged and the merchants began to open their shops. At last, he resolved to go to the Isaac Bridge, where perhaps he might succeed in throwing it into the Neva. But my conscience is a little uneasy that I have not yet given any detailed information about Ivan Yakovovich, an esteemable man in many ways. Like every honest Russian tradesman, Ivan Yakovovich was a terrible drunkard, and although he shaved other people's faces every day, his own was always unshaved. His coat, he never wore an overcoat, was quite mottled, i.e. it had black and become brownish-yellow, and the collar was quite shiny, but instead of three buttons, only the threads by which they had been fastened were to be seen. Ivan Yakovovich was a great cynic, and when Kovalov, a member of the municipal committee, said to him, as was his custom while being shaved, Your hands always smell, Ivan Yakovovich. The latter answered, What do they smell of? I don't know, my friend, but they smell very strong. Ivan Yakovovich, after taking a pinch of snuff, would then, by way of reprisals, set to work to soap him on the cheek, the upper lip, behind the ears, on the chin, and everywhere. This worthy man now stood on the Isaac Bridge. At first he looked round him, then he leant on the railings of the bridge as though he wished to look down and see how many fish were swimming past, and secretly through the nose, wrapped in a piece of cloth, into the water. He felt as if though a ton weight had been lifted off him, and laughed cheerfully. Instead, however, of going to shave any officials, he turned his steps to a building, the signboard on which bore the legend, Teas served here, in order to have a glass of punch when suddenly he perceived at the other end of the bridge a police inspector of imposing exterior, with long whiskers, three-cornered hat, and a sword hanging at his side. He nearly fainted, but the police inspector beckoned to him with his hand and said, Come here, my dear sir. Ivan Yakovovich, knowing how a gentleman should behave, took his hat off quickly, went towards the police inspector and said, I hope you are in the best health. Never mind my health. Tell me, my friend, why were you standing on the bridge? By heaven, gracious sir, I was on my way to my customers and only looked down to see if the river was flowing quickly. That is a lie. You won't get out of it like that. Confess the truth. I am willing to shave your grace two or even three times a week gratis answered Ivan Yakovovich. No, my friend, don't put yourself out. Three barbers are busy with me already, and reckon it a high honour that I let them show me their skill. Now then, out with it. What were you doing there? Ivan Yakovovich grew pale, but here the strange episode vanishes in the mist, and what further happened is not known. Part 2. Kovalov, the member of the municipal committee, awoke fairly early that morning and made a droning noise brrr, brrr, through his lips, as he always did, though he could not say why. He stretched himself and told his valet to give him a little mirror, which was on the table. He wished to look at the heat boil which had appeared on his nose the previous evening, but, to his great astonishment, he saw that instead of his nose, he had a perfectly smooth vacancy in his face. Thoroughly alarmed, he ordered some water to be brought, and rubbed his eyes with a towel. Sure enough, he had no longer a nose. Then he sprang out of bed, and shook himself violently. No, no nose any more. He dressed himself, and went at once to the police superintendent. But, before proceeding further, we must certainly give the reader some information about Kovalov, 
so that they may know what sort of man this member of the municipal committee really was. These committee men, who obtain that title by means of certificates of learning, must not be compared with the committee men appointed for the Carcasses district, who are quite a different kind. The learned committee man, uh, but Russia is such a wonderful country that when one committee man is spoken of, all the others from Riga to Kamchatka refer it to themselves. The same is also true of all other titled officials. Kovalov had been a Caucasian committee man two years previously and could not forget that he had occupied that position, but in order to enhance his own importance, he never called himself committee man, but major. Listen, my dear, he used to say when he met an old woman in the street who sold shirt fronts. Go to my house in Sadovia Street and ask, does Major Kovalov live here? Any child can tell you where it is. <laughs> Accordingly, we will call him for the future Major Kovalov. It was his custom to take a daily walk on the Nevsky Avenue. The collar of his shirt was always remarkably clean and stiff. He wore the same style of whiskers as those that are worn by governors of districts, architects and regimental doctors. In short, all those who have full red cheeks and play a good game of wrist. These whiskers grow straight across the cheek towards the nose. Major Kovalov wore a number of seals, on some of which were engraved memorial bearings, and others the names of the days of the week. He had come to St. Petersburg in the view of obtaining some position corresponding to his rank, if possible that of a vice-governor of the province, but he was prepared to be content with that of a bailiff in some department or other. He was, moreover, not disinclined to marry, but only such a lady who could bring with her a dowry of 200,000 roubles. Accordingly, the reader can judge for themselves what his sensations were when he found in his face, instead of a fairly symmetrical nose, a broad, flat vacancy. To increase his misfortune, not a single Joski was to be seen in the street and so he was obliged to proceed on foot. He wrapped himself up in his cloak and held his handkerchief to his face, as though his nose bled. But perhaps it is all only my imagination. It is impossible that a nose should drop off in such a silly way, he thought, and stepped into the confectioner's shop in order to look into the mirror. Fortunately, no customer was in the shop. Only small shop boys were cleaning it out and putting chairs and tables straight. Others, with sleepy faces, were carrying fresh cakes on trays, and yesterday's newspapers, stained with coffee, were still lying about. Thank God no one is here, he said to himself. Now I can look at myself leisurely. He stepped gingerly up to the mirror and looked. Oh, what an infernal face, he exclaimed and spat with disgust. If there were only something there instead of the nose, but there is absolutely nothing. He bit his lips with vexation, left the confectioners and resolved, quite contrary to his habit, neither to look nor smile at anyone on the street. Suddenly he halted as if rooted to the spot before a door where something extraordinary happened. A carriage drew up at the entrance. The carriage door was opened, and a gentleman in uniform came out and hurried up the steps. How great was Kovalov's terror and astonishment when he saw that it was his own nose. At this extraordinary sight, everything seemed to turn round with him. He felt as though he could hardly keep upright on his legs. But, though trembling all over, as though with fever, he resolved to wait till the nose should return to the carriage. After about two minutes, the nose actually came out again. It wore a gold-embroidered uniform with a stiff high collar, trousers of chamois leather and a sword hung at its side. 
The hat, adorned with a plume, showed that it held the rank of a state councillor. It was obvious that it was paying duty calls. It looked round on both sides, called to the coachman, "Drive on," and got into the carriage, which drove away. Poor Kovalov nearly lost his reason. He did not know what to think of this extraordinary procedure. And indeed, how was it possible that the nose, which only yesterday he had on his face and which could neither walk nor drive, should wear a uniform? He ran after the carriage, which fortunately had stopped a short way off before the Grand Bazaar of Moscow. He hurried towards it and pressed through a crowd of beggar women with their faces bound up, leaving only two openings for the eyes, over whom he had formerly so often made merry. There were only a few people in front of the bazaar. Kovalov was so agitated that he could decide on nothing and looked for the nose everywhere. At last, he saw it standing before a shop. It seemed half buried in its stiff collar and was attentively inspecting the wares displayed. Oh, how could I get at it? Thought Kovalov. Everything, the uniform, the hat, and so on. Show that it is a state councillor. How the deuce has that happened? He began to cough discreetly near it, <coughs> but the nose paid not the least attention. Honourable sir," said Kovalov at last, plucking up courage. Uh, Honourable sir, what do you want? Asked the nose and turned round. It seems to me strange, most respected sir, you should know where you belong, and I find you all of a sudden where. Judge yourself. Pardon me, I do not understand what you are talking about. Explain yourself more distinctly. Naturally,、uh, besides, I am a major. You must admit it is not befitting that I should go about without a nose. An old apple woman on the Ascension Bridge may carry on her business without one, but since I am on the lookout for a post,、uh, besides in many houses I am acquainted with ladies of high position. Madame Tekchayev, wife of a state councillor, and many others. So you see, I do not know, honourable sir, what you. Here the major shrugged his shoulders. Pardon me if one regards the matter from the point of view of duty and honour. You will yourself understand. I understand nothing," answered the nose. "I repeat, please explain yourself more distinctly." "Honourable sir," said Kovalov with dignity, "I do not know how I am to understand your words." It seems to me the matter is as clear as possible, or do you wish? But you are, after all, my own nose. The nose looked at the major and wrinkled its forehead. There you are wrong, respected sir. I am myself. Besides, there can be no close relations between us. To judge by the buttons of your uniform. You must be in quite a different department to mine. So saying, the nose turned away. Kovalov was completely puzzled. He did not know what to do, and still less what to think. At this moment, he heard the pleasant rustling of a lady's dress, and there approached an elderly lady wearing a quantity of lace. And by her side, her graceful daughter, in a white dress which set off her slender figure to advantage, and wearing a light straw hat. Behind the ladies marched a tall lackey with long whiskers. Kovalov advanced a few steps, adjusting his cambric collar, arranged his seals which hung by a little gold chain, and with a smiling face fixed his eyes on the graceful lady, who bowed lightly like a spring flower. And raised to her brow her little white hand with transparent fingers, he smiled still more when he spied under the brim of her hat her little round chin, and part of her cheek faintly tinted with rose colour. But suddenly he sprang back as though he had been scorched. 
he remembered that he had nothing but an absolute blank in place of a nose, and tears started in his eyes. He turned round in order to tell the gentleman in uniform that he was only a state councillor in appearance, but really a scoundrel and a rascal, and nothing else but his own nose. But the nose was no longer there. He had had time to go, doubtless, in order to continue his visits. His disappearance plunged Kovalov into despair. He went back and stood for a moment under a colonnade, looking round him on all sides in hope of perceiving the nose somewhere. He remembered very well that it wore a hat with a plume in it and a gold-embroidered uniform, but he had not noticed the shape of the cloak, nor the colour of the carriages and the horses, nor even whether a lackey stood behind it, and, if so, what sort of livery he wore. Moreover, so many carriages were passing that it would have been difficult to recognise one, and even if he had done so, there would have been no means of stopping it. The day was fine and sunny, an immense crowd was passing to and fro in the Nevsky Avenue. A variegated stream of ladies flowed along the pavement. There was his acquaintance, the Privy Councillor, whom he was accustomed to style General, especially when strangers were present. There was Iragin, his intimate friend who always lost in the evenings at whist, and there another major, who had obtained the rank of committee man in the Caucasus, beckoned to him. "'Go to the deuce,' said Kovalov. "'Sotto voce! Uh, coachman, drive me straight to the superintendent of police!' So saying, he got into a drosky and continued to shout all the time to the coachman, "'Drive hard!' "'Is the police superintendent home?' he asked on entering the front hall. No, sir, answered the porter. He has just gone out. Ah, oh, just as I thought. Yes, continued the porter. He had only just gone out. If you had been a moment earlier, you would perhaps have caught him. Kovalov, still holding his handkerchief to his face, re-entered the Jovsky and cried in a despairing voice, Drive on! Where? asked the coachman. Straight on. But how? There are crossroads here. Shall I go to the right or to the left? The question made Kovalov reflect. In his situation, it was necessary to have recourse to the police, but not because the affair had anything to do with them directly, but because they acted more promptly than other authorities. As for demanding any explanation from the department to which the nose claimed to belong, it would, he felt, be useless, for the answers of that gentleman showed that he regarded nothing as sacred, and he might just as likely have lied in this matter as in saying that he had never seen Kovalov. But, just as he was about to order the coachman to drive to the police station, the idea occurred to him that this rascally scoundrel, who, at their first meeting, had behaved so disloyally towards him, might, profiting by the delay, quit the city secretly and then all his searching would be in vain, or might last over a whole month. Finally, as though visited with a heavenly inspiration, he resolved to go directly to an advertisement office, and to advertise the loss of his nose, giving all its distinctive characteristics in detail, so that anyone who found it might bring it at once to him, or at any rate inform him where it lived. Having decided on this course, he ordered the coachman to drive to the advertisement office, and all the way he continued to punch him in the back. Quick, scoundrel, quick! Yes, sir, answered the coachman, lashing his shaggy horse with the reins. At last they arrived, and Kovalov, out of breath, rushed into a little room where a grey-haired official, in an old coat and with spectacles on his nose, sat at a table, holding his pen between his teeth, counting a heap of copper coins. "'Who takes in the advertisements here?' exclaimed Kovalov. "'At your service, sir,' answered the grey-haired functionary, looking up and then fastening his eyes again on the heap of coins before him. 
I wish to place an advertisement in your paper. Have the kindness to wait a minute, answered the official, putting down figures on paper with one hand and with the other moving two balls on his calculating frame. A lackey whose silver lace coat showed that he served in one of the houses of nobility was standing by the table with a note in his hand and speaking in a lively tone by way of showing himself sociable. Would you believe it, sir? This little dog is really not worth twenty-four kopecks, and for my own part I would not give a farthing for it. But the Countess is quite gone upon it, and offers a hundred roubles reward to anyone who finds it. To tell you the truth, the tastes of these people are very different from ours. They don't mind giving five hundred or a thousand roubles for a poodle, or a pointer, provided it be a good one. The official listened with a serious air while counting the number of letters contained in the note. On either side of the table stood a number of housekeepers, clerks and porters, carrying notes. The writer of one wished to sell a baroche, which had been brought from Paris in 1814, and had been very little used. Others wanted to dispose of a strong drosky, which wanted one spring, a spirited horse, seventeen years old, and so on. The room where these people were collected was very small, and the air was very close. But Kovalov was not affected by it, for he had covered his face with a handkerchief, and because his nose itself was heaven knew where. Sir, allow me to ask you. I am in a great hurry, he said at last impatiently. In a moment, in a moment. Two rubles. Twenty-four kopecks, one minute, one rouble, sixty-four kopecks, said the grey-haired official, throwing the notes back to the housekeepers and porters. What do you wish? he said, turning to Kovalov. I wish, answered the latter, I have just been swindled and cheated, and I cannot get hold of the perpetrator. I only want you to insert an advertisement to say that whoever brings this scandal to me will be well rewarded. What is your name, please? Why do you want to know my name? I have many lady friends, Madame Tchechniev, wife of state councillor, Madame Podtachini, wife of a colonel. Heaven forbid that they should get to hear of it. You can simply write uh, committee man, or better, major. And the man who has run away is your serf? Serf? If it was, it would not be such a great swindle. It is the nose which has absconded. Hmm, what a strange name. And this Mr. Nose has stolen from you a considerable sum? Mr. Nose, uh, you don't understand me. It is my own nose which has gone. I don't know where. The devil has played a trick on me. How has it disappeared? I don't understand. I can't tell you how. But the important point is that now it walks about the city itself as state councillor. That is why I want you to advertise that whoever gets hold of it should bring it as soon as possible to me. Consider, how can I live without such a prominent part of my body? It is not as if it were merely a little toe. I would only have to put my foot in my boot, and no one would notice its absence. Every Thursday I call on the wife of Mr. Chechniev, the state councillor. Madame Podtachini, a colonel's wife, who has a very pretty daughter, is one of my acquaintances. And what am I to do now? I cannot appear before them like this. The official compressed his lips and reflected. No, I cannot insert an advertisement like that, he said after a long pause. What? Why not? Because it might compromise the paper. Suppose everyone could advertise that his nose was lost. People already say that all sorts of nonsense and lies are inserted. But this is not nonsense. There is nothing of that sort in my case. You think so? Listen a minute. Last week there was a case very like it. An official came, just as you have done, bringing an advertisement for the insertion of which he paid two roubles and sixty-three kopecks. 
and this advertisement simply announced the loss of a black-haired poodle. There did not seem to be anything out of the way in it, but it was really a satire. By the poodle was meant the cashier of some establishment or other. But I'm not talking of a poodle, but my own nose, i.e. almost myself. No, you cannot insert your advertisement. But my nose really has disappeared. That is a matter for a doctor. There are said to be people who can provide you with any kind of nose you like. But I see that you are a witty man, and you like to have your little joke. But I swear to you, on my word of honour, look at my face yourself. Why put yourself out? continued the official, taking a pinch of snuff. All the same, if you don't mind, he added with a touch of curiosity, I should like to have a, a look at it. The committee man removed the handkerchief from before his face. Hmm, it certainly does look odd, said the official. It is perfectly flat, like a freshly fried pancake. It is hardly credible. Very well. Are you going to hesitate any more? You see, it is impossible to refuse to advertise my loss. I shall be particularly obliged to you, and I shall be glad that this incident has procured me the pleasure of making your acquaintance. The Major, we see, did not even shrink from a slight humiliation. It certainly is not difficult to advertise it, replied the official but I don't see what good it would do you. However, if you lay so much stress on it, you should apply to someone who has a skilful pen, so that they may describe it as a curious, natural freak, and publish the article in the Northern Bee. Here he took another pinch. For the benefit of youthful readers, <laughs> he wiped his nose, or simply as a matter worthy of arousing public curiosity. The committee man felt completely discouraged. He let his eyes fall absent-mindedly on a daily paper in which theatrical performances were advertised. Reading there the name of an actress whom he knew to be pretty, he involuntarily smiled, and his hand sought his pocket to see if he had a blue ticket. For in Kovalov's opinion, superior officers like himself should not take a lesser-priced seat. But the thought of his lost nose suddenly spoiled everything. The official himself seemed touched at his difficult position. Desiring to console him, he tried to express his sympathy by a few polite words. I much regret, he said, your extraordinary uh, mishap. Will you not try a pinch of snuff? It clears the head, banishes depression, and is a good preventative against hemorrhoids. So saying, he reached his snuff-box out to Kovalov, skillfully concealing at the same time the cover, which was adorned with a portrait of some lady or other. This act, quite innocent in itself, exasperated Kovalov. I don't understand what you find to joke about in the matter, he exclaimed angrily. Don't you see that I lack precisely the essential feature for taking snuff? The devil take your snuff box. I don't want to look at snuff now. Not even the best. Certainly not your vile stuff. So saying, he left the advertisement office in a state of profound irritation and went to the commissary of police. He arrived just as this dignitary was reclining on his couch and saying to himself with a sigh of satisfaction, Yes, I shall make a nice little sum out of that. It might be expected, therefore, that the committee man's visit would be quite inopportune. This police commissary was a great patron of all the arts and industries, but what he liked above everything else was a check. It is a thing, he used to say to which it is not easy to find an equivalent. It requires no food, it does not take up much room, it stays in one's pocket, and if it falls, it is not broken.
the commissary, a covil of a fairly rigid reception, saying that the afternoon was not the best time to come with a case, that nature required one to rest little after eating. This showed the committee man that the commissary was acquainted with the aphorisms of the ancient sages, and that respectable people did not have their noses stolen. The last allusion was too direct. We must remember that Kovalov was a very sensitive man. He did not mind anything said against him as an individual, but he could not endure any reflection on his rank or social position. He even believed that in comedies one might allow attacks on junior officers, but never on their seniors. The commissary's reception of him hurt his feelings so much that he raised his head proudly and said with dignity, After such insulting expressions on your part, I have nothing more to say. And he left the place. He reached his house quite wearied out. It was already growing dark. After all his fruitless search, his room seemed to him melancholy and even ugly. In the vestibule he saw his valet, Avan, stretched on the leather couch and amusing himself by spitting at the ceiling, which he did very cleverly, hitting every time the same spot. His servant's equanimity enraged him. He struck him on the forehead with his hat and said, You good for nothing! You were always playing the fool! Avan rose quickly and hastened to take off his master's cloak. Once in his room, the major, tired and depressed, threw himself in an armchair and, after sighing a while, began to soliloquise. In heaven's name, why should such a misfortune befall me? If I had lost an arm or a leg, it would be less insupportable. But a man without a nose? Devil take it! What is he good for? He is only fit to be thrown out of the window. If it had been taken from me in war, or in a duel, or if I had lost it by my own fault, but it has disappeared inexplicably. But no, it is impossible. He continued after reflecting a few moments. It is incredible that a nose can disappear like that. Quite incredible. I must be dreaming, or suffering from some hallucination. Perhaps I swallowed, by mistake, instead of water, the brandy which I rub on my chin after being shaved. That fall of an avan must have forgotten to take it away, and I must have swallowed it. In order to find out whether he were really drunk, the Major pinched himself so hard that he involuntarily uttered a cry. The pain convinced him that he was quite wide awake. He walked slowly to the looking-glass, and at first closed his eyes, hoping to see his nose suddenly in its proper place. But on opening them, he started back. Oh, what a hideous sight, he exclaimed. It was really incomprehensible. One might easily lose a button, a silver spoon, a watch, or something similar. But a loss like this, and in one's own dwelling... After considering all the circumstances, Major Kovalov felt inclined to suppose that the cause of his trouble should be laid at the door of Madame Potocina, the colonel's wife, who wished him to marry her daughter. He himself paid her court readily, but always avoided coming to the point, and when the lady one day told him point-blank that she wished him to marry her daughter, he gently drew back, declaring that he was still too young and that he had to serve five years more before he would be forty-two. This must be the reason why the lady, in revenge, had resolved to bring him into disgrace, and had hired two sorceresses for that object. One thing was certain, his nose had not been cut off. No one had entered his room, and as for Ivan Yakovlevich, he had been shaved by him on Wednesday, and during that day and the whole of Thursday his nose had been there, as he knew and well remembered. Moreover, if his nose had been cut off, he would naturally have felt pain, and doubtless the wound would have not healed so quickly, nor would the surface have been as flat as a pancake. 
All kinds of plans passed through his head. Should he bring a legal action to the wife of a superior officer? Or should he go to her and charge her openly with her treachery? His reflections were interrupted by a sudden light, which shone through all the chinks of the door, showing that Ivan had lit the wax candles in the vestibule. Soon Ivan himself came in with the light. Kovalov quickly seized a handkerchief and covered the place where his nose had been the evening before, so that his blockhead of a servant might not gape with his mouth wide open when he saw his master's extraordinary appearance. Scarcely had Ivan returned to the vestibule when a stranger's voice was heard there. Does Major Kolov live here? it asked. Come in, said the Major, rising rapidly and opening the door. He saw a police official of pleasant appearance, with grey whiskers and fairly full cheeks, the same who at the commencement of this story was standing at the edge of the Isaac Bridge. You have lost your nose, he asked. <laughs> exactly so. It has been found. What? D what do you say? stammered Major Kovalov. Joy had suddenly paralysed his tongue. He stared at the police commissary on whose cheeks and full lips fell the flickering light of the candle. How was it? he asked at last. By a very singular chance, it has been arrested just as it was getting into a carriage for Riga. Its passport had been made out some time ago in the name of an official. And what is still more strange, I myself took it at first glance for a gentleman. Fortunately, I had my glasses with me, and then I saw at once that it was a nose. I am short-sighted, you know. And as you stand before me, I cannot distinguish your nose, your beard, or anything else. My mother-in-law can hardly see at all. Kovalov was beside himself with excitement. Where is it? Where? I will hasten there at once. Don't put yourself out. Knowing that you need it, I have brought it with me. Another singular thing is that the principal culprit in the matter is a scoundrel of a barber living in the Ascension Avenue, who is now safely locked up. I had long suspected him of drunkenness and theft. Only the day before yesterday he stole some buttons in a shop. Your nose is quite uninjured. So saying, the police commissary put his hand in his pocket and brought out the nose, wrapped up in paper. Yes, yes, that is it, exclaimed Kovalov. Uh, will you not stay and drink a cup of tea with me? I should like to very much, but I cannot. I must go at once to the House of Correction. The cost of living is very high nowadays. My mother-in-law lives with me, and there are several children, and the eldest is very hopeful and intelligent. But I have no means for their education. After the commissary's departure, Kovalov remained for some time plunged in a kind of vague reverie. He did not recover full consciousness for several moments. So great was the effect of this unexpected good news. He placed the recovered nose carefully in the palm of his hand and examined it again with the greatest attention. Yes, this is it, he said to himself. Here is the heat boil on the left side, which came out yesterday. And he nearly laughed aloud with delight. But nothing is permanent in this world. Joy in the second moment of its arrival is already less keen in the first, is still fainter in the third, and finishes by coalescing with our normal mental state, just as the circles which the fall of a pebble forms on the surface of water gradually die away. Kovalov began to meditate and saw that his difficulties were not yet over. His nose had been recovered, but it had to be joined on again in its proper place. And suppose it could not. 
As he put this question to himself, Kovalov grew pale. With a feeling of indescribable dread, he rushed towards his dressing table and stood before the mirror in order that he might not place his nose crookedly. His hands trembled. Very carefully, he placed it where it had been before. Horror! It did not remain there. He held it to his mouth and warmed it a little with his breath, and then placed it there again. But it would not hold. Hold on, you stupid, he said. But the nose seemed to be made of wood and fell back on the table with a strange noise, as though it had been a cork. The major's face began to twitch feverishly. Is it possible that it won't stick? He asked himself, full of alarm. But however often he tried, all his efforts were in vain. He called Ivan and sent him to fetch the doctor who occupied the finest flat in the mansion. This doctor was a man of imposing appearance, who had magnificent black whiskers and a healthy wife. He ate fresh apples every morning and cleaned his teeth with extreme care, using five different toothbrushes for three quarters of an hour daily. The doctor came immediately. After having asked the major when his misfortune had happened, he raised his chin and gave him a fillip with his finger, just where the nose had been, in such a way that the major suddenly threw back his head and struck the wall with it. The doctor said that did not matter. Then, making him turn his face to the right, he felt the vacant place and said, Hum. Then, he made him turn to the left and did the same. Finally, he gave him a fillip with his finger so that the major started like a horse whose teeth were being examined. After this experiment, the doctor shook his head and said, No, it cannot be done. Eva, remain as you are lest something worse happen. Certainly one could replace it at once, but I assure you the remedy will be far worse than the disease. Oh, very fine, but how am I to go on without a nose? answered Kovalov. There is nothing worse than that. How can I show myself with such a villainous appearance? I go into good society, and this evening I am invited to two parties. I know several ladies... Madame Chechekniev, the wife of the state councillor, Madame Podchechenia, although after what she has done, I don't want to have nothing to do with her except through the agency of the police. I beg you, continued Kovalov in a supplicated tone, find some way or other of replacing it, even if it is not quite firm, as long as it holds at all. I can keep it in place sometimes with my hand, whenever there is any risk. Besides, I do not even dance, so that it is not likely to be injured by any sudden movement. As for your fee, be in no anxiety about that. I can well afford it. Believe me, answered the doctor, in a voice which was neither too high nor too low, but soft and almost magnetic. I do not treat patience from love of gain. That would be to the contrary of my principles, and to my art. It is true that I accept fees, but that is only not to hurt my patient's feelings by refusing them. I could certainly replace your nose, but I assure you on my word of honour, it would only make matters worse. Rather let nature do her own work. Wash the place often with cold water, and I assure you that even without a nose, you will be just as well as if you had one. As to the nose itself, I advise you to have it preserved in a bottle of spirits, or, still better, of warm vinegar mixed with two spoonfuls of brandy, and then you could sell it at a good price. I would be willing to take it myself, provided you do not ask too much. No, no, I shall not sell it at any price. I would rather it were lost again. Hmm. Excuse me, said the doctor, taking his leave. I hope to be useful to you, but I can do nothing more. You are at any rate convinced 
of my good will. So saying, the doctor left the room with a dignified air. Kovalov did not even notice his departure. Absorbed in a profound reverie, he only saw the edge of his snow-white cuffs emerging from the sleeves of his black coat. The next day, he resolved, before bringing formal action, to write to the colonel's wife and see whether she would not return to him without further dispute that which she had deprived him. The letter ran as follows. To Madame Alexandria Podachina, I hardly understand your method of action. Be sure that by adopting such a cause you will gain nothing and will certainly not succeed in making me marry your daughter. Believe me, the story of my nose has become well known. It is you and no other else who have taken the principal part in it. Its unexpected separation from the place which it occupied, its flight and its appearances, sometimes in the disguise of an official, sometimes in proper person, are nothing but the consequence of unholy spells employed by you or by any persons who, like you, are addicted to such honourable pursuits. Of my part, I wish to inform you that if the above-mentioned nose is not restored to-day in its proper place, I shall be obliged to have recourse to a legal procedure. For the rest, with all respect, I have the honour to be your humble servant, Planton Kovalov. The reply was not long in coming, and was as follows. Major Platon Kovalov, your letter has profoundly astonished me. I must confess that I had not expected such unjust reproaches on your part. I assure you that the official of whom you speak has not been at my house, either disguised or in his proper person. It is true that Filip Ivanovich Potanchekov has paid visits to my house, and though he has actually asked for my daughter's hand, and was a man of good breeding, respectable and intelligent, I never gave him any hope. Again, you say something about her nose. If you intend to imply by that that I wish to snub you, i.e. to meet you with a refusal, I am very astonished, because, as you well know, I was quite the opposite of mind. If, after this, you wish to ask for my daughter's hand, I should be glad to gratify you for such has also been the object of my most fervent desire, in the hope of the accomplishment of which I remain yours most sincerely. Alexandria Podlachina No, said Kovalov, after having reperused the letter. She is certainly not guilty. It is impossible. Such a letter could not be written by a criminal. The committee man was experienced in such matters, for he had been officially deputed to conduct criminal investigations while in the Caucasus. But then how, and by what trick of fate, has the thing happened? He said to himself with a gesture of discouragement. <laughs> the devil must be at the bottom of it. Meanwhile, the rumour of this extraordinary event had spread all over the city, and, as is generally the case, not without numerous additions. At that period, there was a general disposition to believe in the miraculous. The public had recently been impressed by experiments in magnetism. The story of the floating chairs in Konyachenchnya Street was still quite recent, and there was nothing astonishing in hearing soon afterwards that Major Kovalov's nose had been seen walking every day at three o'clock on the Nevsky Avenue. The crowd of curious spectators which gathered there daily was enormous. On one occasion someone spread a report that the nose was in Junker's stores, and immediately the place was besieged by such a crowd that the police had to interfere and establish order. A certain speculator, with a grave whiskered face, who sold cakes at the theatre door, had some strong wooden benches made which he placed before the window of the stores and obligingly invited the public to stand on them and look in, at the modest charge of twenty-four kopecks. 
A veteran colonel leaving his house earlier than usual, expressly for the purpose, had the greatest difficulty in elbowing his way through the crowd, but to his great indignation he saw nothing in the store window but an ordinary flannel waistcoat and a flowered lithograph representing a young girl darning a stocking while an elegant youth in a waistcoat with large lapels watched her from behind a tree. The picture had hung in that same place for more than ten years. The colonel went off growling savagely to himself. How can the fools let themselves be excited by such idiotic stories? Then another rumour got abroad to the effect that the nose of Major Kovalov was in the habit of walking not on the Nevsky Avenue, but in the tourist gardens. Some students of the Academy of Surgery went there on purpose to see it. A high-born lady wrote to the keeper of the gardens, asking him to show her children this rare phenomenon, and to give them some suitable instruction on the occasion. All these incidents were eagerly collected by the town wits who just then were very short of anecdotes adapted to amuse ladies. On the other hand, the minority of solid, sober people were very much displeased. One gentleman asserted with great indignation that he could not understand how in our enlightened age such absurdities could spread abroad, and he was astonished that the government did not direct their attention to the matter. This gentleman evidently belonged to the category of those people who wished the government to interfere in everything, even in their daily quarrels with their wives. But here, the course of offence is again obscured by a veil. Part 3 Strange events happen in this world, events which are sometimes entirely improbable. The same nose which had masqueraded as a state councillor and caused so much sensation in the town was found one morning in its proper place, i.e. between the cheeks of Major Kovalov, as if nothing had happened. This occurred on the 7th of April. On awaking, the Major looked by chance into a mirror and perceived a nose. He quickly put his hand to it. It was there beyond a doubt. Oh! Oh! exclaimed Kovalov. For sheer joy he was on the point of performing a dance barefooted across his room, but the entrance of a van prevented him. He told him to bring water, and after washing himself he looked again in the glass. The nose was there. Then he dried his face with a towel and looked again. Yes, there was no mistake about it. Look here, Ivan. It seems to me that I have a heat boil on my nose he said to his valet, and he thought to himself at the same time, That will be a nice business if Ivan says to me, No, sir, not only is there no boil, but your nose itself is not there. But Ivan answered, There's nothing there, sir. I can see no boil on your nose. Good, good, exclaimed the Major, and snapped his fingers with delight. At this moment, the barber, Ivan Yakovovich, put his head in at the door, but as timidly as a cat which has just been beaten for stealing lard. Tell me first, are your hands clean? asked Kovalov when he saw him. Yes, sir. You lie. I swear they are perfectly clean, sir. Very well. Then come here. Kovalov seated himself. Ivanovich tied a napkin under his chin, and in the twinkling of an eye covered his beard and part of his cheeks with a copious creamy lava. There it is, said the barber to himself, as he glanced at the nose. Then he bent his head a little and examined it from one side. Yes, it actually is the nose. Really, when one thinks, he continued, pursuing his mental soliloquy and still looking at it. Then, quite gently, with infinite precaution, he raised two fingers in the air in order to take hold of it by its extremity, as he was accustomed to do. Now then, take care, Kovalov exclaimed. Ivan Yakovovich let his arm fall and felt more embarrassed than he had ever done in his life. At last, 
he began to pass the razor very lightly over the major's chin, and though it was very difficult to shave him without using the olfactory organ as part of support, he succeeded, however, by placing his wrinkled thumb against the major's lower jaw and cheek, thus overcoming all obstacles and bringing this task to a safe conclusion. When the barber had finished, Kovalov hastened to dress himself, took a drovsky and drove straight to the confectioner's. As he entered it, he ordered a cup of chocolate, and then he stepped straight to the mirror. The nose was there. He returned joyfully, and regarded with a satirical expression two officers who were in the shop, one of whom possessed a nose not much larger than a waistcoat button. After that, he went to the office of the department, where he had applied for the post of vice-governor of a province or government bailiff. As he passed through the hall of reception, he cast a glance at the mirror. The nose was there. Then he went to pay a visit to another committee man, a very sarcastic personage, to whom he was accustomed to say in answer to his raillery, Yes, I know you are the funniest fellow in St. Petersburg. On the way, he said to himself, if the major does not burst into laughter at the sight of me, that is a most certain sign that everything is in its accustomed place. But the major said nothing. Very good, thought Kovalov. As he returned, he met Madame Potocina with her daughter. He accosted them, and they responded very graciously. The conversation lasted a long time, during which he took more than one pinch of snuff, saying to himself, no, you haven't caught me yet, coquettes that you are, and as to the daughter, I shan't marry her at all. After that, the Major resumed his walks on the Nivsky Avenue, and his visits to the theatre as if nothing had happened. His nose also remained in its place as if it had never quitted it. From that time, he was always to be seen smiling, in a good humour, and paying attentions to pretty girls. Part 4 Such was the occurrence which took place on the northern capital of our vast empire. On considering the account carefully, we see that there is a good deal which looks improbable about it. Not to speak of the strange disappearance of the nose, and its appearance in different places under the disguise of a councillor of state, how was it that Kovalov did not understand that one cannot decently advertise for a lost nose? I do not mean to say that he would have had to pay much for the advertisement. That is a mere trifle, and I am not one of those who attach too much importance to money. But to advertise in such a case is not proper nor befitting. Another difficulty is... How was the nose found in the baked loaf? And how did Ivan Yakovovich himself? No, I don't understand it at all. But the most incomprehensible thing of all is how authors can choose such subjects for their stories. That really surpasses my understanding. In the first place, no advantage results from it for the country. And in the second place, no harm results either. All the same, when one reflects well, there really is something in the matter. Whatever may be said to the contrary, such cases do occur. Rarely, it is true. But now and then, actually. The End